Kelly's his, uh, inheritance is being felt now with the trials in Saddam Hussein and Iraq, the trials in Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, uh, the International Criminal Court. But uh, the public was slow to realize the fact that this man wanted to change the face of the planet. To eliminate 5,000 years of conflict where the law of force was the order of the day, and to replace that time and, and women in exile and all that, the credibility of some of the witnesses would not have been uh, the greatest. He wanted to rely on documents. That's why he, I mean, he paid the price. Well, today I think we're reading more and more of the analysis of what went on, and you have the, the benefit of standing back after several decades, many decades, 60 years, and, yeah. and interpreting the importance yeah. of this. Sure. Can you summarize again, if the headline was to read today, what, what is the resounding message from Nuremberg? Well, it's hard to summarize Nuremberg in one word. Uh, uh, Nuremberg changed the face of the planet, it made ind individuals responsible in their own it said that sovereigns were not exempt. It said that superiorities was no defense. Uh, and it said that uh, there were certain definable crimes that people should not commit. One is genocide. But uh, there shouldn't be an extermination of a race or religion or nationality of people. Was wrong to destroy people without any checking on what they had done. That was, secondly, it was important that, that international human rights were a reality after Nuremberg. For instance, the Germans extinguished Jews' rights under the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, and uh, we were stored in 1946. Uh, I think uh, Nuremberg is an autopsy on a dictatorship, and we learned the levers of power in the dictatorship that made for that type of society. The Nazis destroyed the free press and then destroyed the, uh, the judiciary. Those were checks and balances. And we learned in the, uh, in the Watergate case that it's important to have an independent judiciary. Uh, it's also important to have an important independent media, which we learned in the Vietnam experience uh, where the independence of the New York Times was challenged. So this, these were two institutions that we learned to value more highly because of the Nuremberg experience. These were, the destruction of these institutions were the free resource or the dictatorship of the Nazis. There's, with everything and all the atrocities that are going on in the world now, we, we all think we should be able to learn from history, but somehow we don't. Um, how, you know, when people today are quick to rush to judgment when Saddam Hussein is resurrected from the ground and, and all of these, again, um, war crimes and um, genocide that's happening, how can we keep people from being quick to rush to judgment, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm not saying it very well, but. It's important, I guess it's important, I'm sure you would agree, that, that we don't send them to the gallows right away. Well, we need some useful, uh, some useful television and newspaper coverage that uh, maybe there ought to be a requirement that there, might, uh, there ought to be more public issues coverage in the media. The media tells you that somebody got hit over the head and, uh, or beat his wife 
or murdered his lover. That's information, but that doesn't cover any understanding of trends or issues. Somehow we need to reach people to, uh, as best we can so that they have a background for reacting to issues. Otherwise, it's knee-jerk reaction. Thank you much, uh, Greg. You really created something here. And uh, we all ought to take a bow to you uh, for what you've done in Crete. Uh, my words tonight are from the heart. I'm indeed honored to be here tonight to honor the memory of a very distinguished American, a man whose work will live long in our history. Robert Jackson is remembered today as a Supreme Court Justice and the father of the Nuremberg Trials. Yet the road he took to becoming one of the most influential men in America and international law was not a traditional one. In many ways, Jackson is the embodiment of the American dream. As you know, he is educated right here in this area and with only a high school education, plus some study at Albany Law School, he entered the legal profession, apprenticing under local lawyers, where he tried cases in bars and town halls. It was still acceptable at that time to learn law this way. But when Jackson was appointed to the Supreme Court, he was the only justice at that time who had not graduated from law school or even college. Instead, he spent two decades practicing law locally in western New York before moving to Washington, to D.C., when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president. Jackson's rise from a local country lawyer to the top of his field was based on merit not knowing the right people, not by having his ticket punched at the right times in his career. Robert Jackson was his own person. I knew this firsthand. Jackson's closing statement was delivered on July 26, 1946. I was asked to prepare a small section of it dealing with the German military. As it turned, up, I it turned out, I stayed up all night uh, during doing this, and I was very proud of what I had produced. The day after my all-night stint, I rushed to the press room to see whether any of my words had been used in the final document. When I saw the closing statement in final form, on close examination, I found that none of my words were used, although perhaps in one or two instances, my ideas were used in the final draft. In checking around with others after this episode, I found that Jackson did not believe in ghosts. If he were to speak, the words must be his own and not those of another. And I would note in passing that his speeches were indeed distinctively memorable and that they contained phrases which I believe will live forever. Robert Jackson, I believe, always liked Rudyard Kipling. And I think that Kipling's maxim, quote, he travels fastest who travels alone, end of quote, was his guiding light. This is the story of Robert Jackson's involvement in Nuremberg. In a nutshell, it was his initiative that created Nuremberg. On much of the journey, he traveled alone. It's appropriate now to look, at, now I believe, to look at some of the qualities which made Jackson great and able to change the face of the planet. Above all, Jackson had vision. His vision was a world ruled by law, in which peace and justice were the order of the day. And he staked his career 
and indeed his life on an attempt to ensure that his vision became a reality, both in his world and the world of the future. He could think beyond his environment and vision a world ruled by law rather than force. He wanted a world where men and women of all nations could live together under a set of principles which he believed would ensure the peace and security of the world. This was a daring dream because its implementation would ensure a planet of peoples at peace with themselves and with each other. It would reverse 5,000 years of human history where anarchy and the law of force were the order of the day. Jackson said it all in his opening address at Nuremberg when he said that Nuremberg was one of the most significant tributes that power had ever paid to reason. To accomplish this objective, Jackson felt that it would be important in setting the stage for future human history to ensure a fair trial of the Nuremberg defendants. He felt that the trial should be an example for all of mankind to be guided, to be guided by, not only in the present, but also for the future. In a speech before the American Society of International Law on April 13, 1945, which preceded his appointment at Nuremberg, he stressed the need for fairness in conducting the trial of the Nazi war criminals. Wanted no conviction without adequate supporting evidence. Moreover, when it came to the negotiations in London, which preceded the trials, he insisted on a presumption of innocence. He wanted no part of a system where guilt was presumed. When it came to the trial at Nuremberg, Jackson wanted defendants represented by competent German counsel and was successful in securing General Eisenhower's financial support for this purpose. I can say firsthand that a number of these German lawyers were extremely common. Here I cite Hans Flaxner counsel for Albert Speer, who I knew quite well, and Otto Kranzler, the lawyer for Karl Dernick, the U-boat king and Hitler's designated successors, and also Frederick Berghold of the counsel for Erhard Miltz and Martin Bormann. Jackson's greatest characteristic was his courage. It took real courage to implement his vision, which was so different from the world in which he was born. Jackson was an innovator with courage and action-oriented. Marvey recognized the need for change, and he did something about it. Suffice it to say that Jackson stuck to his guns with his drive to create a world ruled by law based on justice, and we're better for it. I think it is now important to look at some of Jackson's achievements as they exist in today's world. First, Jackson introduced the concept of international human rights, or human rights with an international dimension. To illustrate, Germany wiped out the rights of the Jews in Germany in 1935. But in 1946, Nuremberg held that Germany's Jews had rights which were international in scope and thus could not be the subject of disenfranchisement in Germany. That was an important com concept because it meant that the citizens of the world had a common dimension of international human rights. In Europe today, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights is based on Jackson's initiatives at Nuremberg. Secondly, Jackson felt that sovereigns should not be immune for the crimes they committed in the name of nation states. He felt that with authority went responsibility. Through his intervention, the long-held doctrine of sovereign immunity was reversed, and leaders like Herman Gary were brought to justice and held responsible for their crimes. 
Since then, heads of state such as Slobodan Milosevic and Saddam Hussein were brought to justice for trial and punishment for their crimes. Had not Jackson acted to prevent it under the doctrine of superior orders, almost every Nazi would have had a good escape route for avoiding responsibility for his crimes. Jackson cut off this escape route in the early negotiations with the three other allies which preceded Nuremberg. As it turned out, to have allowed this defense at Nuremberg would have been a disaster. This is because many of the orders under which the Nazi leaders operated were issued by Hitler, and he was presumed dead at the time of Nuremberg. It is a matter of importance that in the charters of the trials subsequent to Nuremberg and the trial field manuals of the major powers, this defense of superior orders has been largely eliminated. So in today's world, this defense to war crimes is largely extinct. Jackson felt that the most important crime dealt with that Nuremberg was crimes against peace, also known as aggressive war. Here we mean invasions, attacks, and other actions, aggressive actions in violation of international treaties, etc. Obviously, this involves the issue of sovereignty, something that Jackson did not believe a nation's leaders could hide behind. Yet, while many of the Nuremberg defendants were convicted of this charge, little progress has been made since then in implementing Jackson's vision in this area. Today, Nuremberg is a recognized as a turning point in international law. It was not, however, all, 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 always viewed in such a positive light. Jackson withstood the slings and arrows of his countrymen. While at Nuremberg, Jackson remained a justice on the Supreme Court. At that time, the Chief Justice was Harlan Fiskstone. Fisk While Jackson was at Nuremberg trying to build a new rule of law in the world, Jackson Stone characterized Nuremberg as Jackson's, quote, high-class lynching expedition, end of quote. In his writings, Jackson struck back, but he never forgot the attack by the Chief Justice of the United States whose responsible was to pursue a rule of law in the United States. Another opponent of, Jack, Nurem, of Nuremberg was Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio. In a speech at Kenyon College on November 1946, Taft felt crocodile tears for the Nuremberg defendants and said that Nuremberg was a bad example for a rule of law in Europe. Under political pressure, Taft re retracted some of the thrust of his remarks. But the sting of Jackson's criticism hurt, ja hurt of Taft's criticism hurt Jackson. Another Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court Justice, William O. Douglas, joined the critics of Jackson. And Jackson had few, if any, legal cheerleaders in the United States. The American Bar Association did not endorse Nuremberg at that time, and many leaders of the bar were critical of Nuremberg. President Truman thanked Jackson for what he had accomplished at Nuremberg, but at times his seemed to be a lonely voice in favor of Nuremberg and against Jackson's critics. I myself, when I returned from Nuremberg, had trouble getting a job despite high academic credentials at the Yale Law School, presumably because prospective employers did not agree with Nuremberg. The media at the time did not do a good job of promoting an understanding of Jackson and his work at Nuremberg. There were those in the news media who were critical of Nuremberg. They, re they reported unfavorably on Jackson's confrontation with Hermann Goering in his cross-examination of the number two Nazi in the Nuremberg courtroom. It almost seemed at times that some of the media rooted for Goering in the process. Moreover, the Nuremberg court 
under Chief Justice Jeffrey Lawrence of the UK did not rein in Goering to limit his lengthy responses to Jackson's questions. Finally, after ja Nuremberg, Jackson returned to the court, which was uh, uh, Jackson's return to the court was not without unpleasantness. For example, Jackson and Justice Hugo Black, a fellow justice Supreme Court, reportedly did not speak for a year after Jackson had returned to the court. Robert Jackson's work is history. Its inheritance is with us today <coughs> in many spheres of international life. <coughs> Universal Declaration on Human Rights is with us in inheritance at Nuremberg. As are the Genocide Convention, Torture Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights. <coughs> they are part of, part of this world in which we live and part of inheritance from Jackson. But there's one blot on Jackson's memory which needs attention in this country. At Nuremberg, Jackson said, quote, as we pass a poison chalice to the lips of these defendants, we pass it to our lips as well, end of quote. This meant that those nations who brought the Nuremberg proceedings and adopted the Nuremberg principles were to abide by these principles themselves. <coughs> this has been the case with the British and French, but not with the United States. In 2002, the International Criminal Court was established for the purpose of inter institutionalizing the Nuremberg Principles. 102 nations of the world are now parties to the court, including many of our good friends in Europe and other friendly nations such as Canada and Australia. This is not true of the United States. President Clinton signed on behalf of the United States the Rome Chapter Statute, which established the court. But when the Bush administration took over office, it, quote, unsigned it, end of quote, it. The avowed reason for rejecting the International Criminal Court was the concern that U.S. soldiers would be subject to the jurisdiction of the court and subject to prosecution for crimes as defined by the statute. But this assumption is unfounded. The statute established the International Criminal Court provides that if nations, if the nations of the person's charge prosecutes its own, the court has no jurisdiction whatsoever. Here it is important that you note that U.S. soldiers who violate, an who violate international law are tried solely under our procedures. And therefore, the International Criminal Court would have no jurisdiction in these cases. So the European U.S. concerns are without substance. Another area of concern is the crime of aggressive war, which Jackson thought was the most serious crime in Nuremberg. When the Rome statute, while the Rome statute defines the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to, to include aggression as a crime, it does not provide a definition. Aggression cannot be defined un un <coughs> until the statute can be amended in, in 2009. At that time, hopefully, a definition of aggression will be negotiated and ready for consideration and acceptance. However, unless the U.S. is party to the court by then, we can have no say in what constitutes aggression. The United States, which through Robert Jackson created modern international law, will have to sit idly by on the sidelines. The United States and other powers such as China have been unwilling to give up some degree of sovereignty, namely the right to wage aggressive war, to ensure a better world. The U.S., for one, has committed crimes against peace in the number of wars, including Vietnam, Panama, and Grenada. Moreover, the Soviet Union has engaged in the crime of aggression in Afghanistan and Eastern Europe, 
and China is continually threatening Taiwan. I think that nations of the world should, by treaty, renounce aggression through a non-aggression pact. I hope that if aggression is precisely defined in such a pact, that the signatories would feel it in their interest to abide by it. To sum up, we now have war crimes courts in operation, deriving from Jackson, covering the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Iraq, and Sierra Leone, as well as the International Criminal Court at Hague, enforcing the principles Jackson and Norman at Nuremberg. We also have the prospect of other trials in the future, such as that projected for Cambodia. Judging, judging based on what has occurred to date, it is fair statement that Jackson's impact will grow significantly in the future, and the world will be better for it. Jackson summarized what he did at Nuremberg in a few words, quote, this is the first case I have ever tried where I had to persuade others that a court should be established. Help negotiate its establishment, and when that was done, not only to prepare my case, but to find a courtroom in which to quiet, try it, end of quote. In a nutshell, this summarizes what Jackson accomplished at Nuremberg. And when all is said and done, Nuremberg was the most important trial in history. Jackson's qualities of vision, fairness, courage were unique. And in fact, Nuremberg would never become a reality without the thrust they gave him to pursue a better world. We owe him and Warren County a deep debt of gratitude for all he did in, in pursuit of a better world, where law and justice would be the order of the day. May we long remember Robert Jackson and his magnificent achievements. Thank you. that was shown on the brief video was one which showed uh, Ambassador David Schiffer uh, talking to Henry King. Part of the biography that I did not probably share is that Henry King, together with two other former Nuremberg prosecutors, were part of an NGO group which in 1988 was in Rome. Yeah, and, uh, 90, uh, 98. 98, excuse me, uh, 1998 in Rome negotiating that treaty regarding the International Criminal Court, of which ultimately the United States did not become signatories. But on behalf of the United States, Henry, Ben Ferenc, and Whitney Harris were uh, there and negotiating. And Henry, as you just saw, is not a guy who relishes just in what occurred 60 years ago in Nuremberg. Uh, he's not only real then, real now, and he's very passionate about what he believes in. Uh, and to Henry King, uh, we say a hearty thank you on behalf oh, of the you. Jackson Center and everybody else who's here. Um, but before we, we call it an evening, uh, we've got a little bit of time and... Well, uh, I wanted to add that the three Nuremberg prosecutors were to a considerable extent responsible for getting the crime of aggression included in the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court. And this may be the most important achievement of the International Criminal Court. I think the U.S. ought to join so that it can have a say on how this is, aggression is shaped up. There are all kinds of questions on aggression. I'm not going to go into it. But uh, our invasions in aggression is uh, the takeover of Austria, Czechoslovakia, aggression. Uh, there are many forms of aggression. The U.S. ought to be there and have a say in it. We have questions from folks in the audience. Um, I will lead because you did a book on Albert Speer, and while yeah. people are gathering their thoughts, tell us a little bit about what your reflections were of the chief Nazi architect, Albert Speer. 
Well, I think one of the things in life is that uh, you run into people who are enormously ambitious. Uh, their ambitions are vertical. They have no concern for the society in which they live. This is true of many in the corporate world. And Spear is the ultimate example of a person who is absolutely gifted and brilliant. But he served his ambition by doing Hitler's bidding. And uh, he closed his eyes to Crystal Knight. He told me that when he drove to work that following day. Uh, he closed his eyes to the horrors of the Nazi regime. And uh, the meaning of my book is that uh, we have to think horizontal and not just vertical. That uh, fulfillment can be horizontal and also uh, as well as uh, vertical. But uh, one should not shut out the other, particularly the, the ambition that one has to serve his, his or her own ends should not be blind the individual to the needs of society. Concern for others is what the book is all about. And I describe uh, the, the tragic story of a man who was one of the most, Hitler called Sphere the greatest genius of all time. I'm not sure, I think Einstein was, but I think that uh, he was a genius. And I knew him better than any other individual on the US side. The German people know him as well as I did. But that's a story of uh, a life which I, I, the biography is to give meaning to the concerns of society and not to just engage in self-interest. Self because there's fulfillment in doing it horizontal and not just vertical. You talk about uh, degrees of separation. Shake, shake Henry's hand, you are one degree away from Albert Speer. It's amazing. Uh, questions from anybody out here? Want, curious about- Maybe the, I answered all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, the United States Constitution says that the right to be a citizen ends when they infringe upon another citizen. Do you think there should be some sort of international agreement of the sort? Uh, could I, do you repeat the question? Or just a little louder. Uh, the U.S. Constitution states that the uh, right to be a citizen ends when they infringe upon a, another citizen. Do you think that there should be an international agreement kind of that, that states that so that when one nation infringes upon the uh, sovereignty of another, uh, that that becomes legal? Well, that's a big issue today. Uh, you know, you have human rights in Darfur uh, that are being violated. You have them in Somalia, other places. This is an issue, that's a good question, but this is an issue that uh, the UN is working on but has not worked out. What's the right of uh, intervention in a country where uh, human rights are being stamped on? Uh, it involves a sovereignty question. Uh, but we, we, this is one of the areas where the law is still unclear. Uh, we're offended by what happens in many African territories uh, because human rights are violated and they make ch ch child soldiers and all that. But uh, uh, I think it, in the long run we'll get some resolution <coughs> where the General Assembly of the UN speaks on an issue and says this is wrong. And if we could get uh, China and Russia to go on the Security Council, I think we could deal with that. Uh, the, the, the Chinese and the Russians, uh, I, to my knowledge, have not subscribed to the idea of intervention where you have human rights violations. But your, your question is, is on the frontiers of international law today. And I've tried to write on it. I don't remember everything I said. It was a very long article. <laughs> I don't commend it to your reading. 
you're, you're, uh, you should come to Chautauqua uh, August 29th, where Henry King, together with all of the current prosecutors of international criminal or military tribunals throughout the world will be convening at Chautauqua at the Jackson Center and Chautauqua Institution and Syracuse Law and others uh, to talk about that subject. Right, Henry? I mean, yeah, the reality right. is you will have the chief prosecutors from Cambodia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia. They're all gathering together for the first time ever. Yeah. They've never been together, yeah. but they're all going to show up at Chautauqua. August 28th, I want you to be there because you're the first questioner because that's the one that will last for the next three hours and how to answer the question. Yeah. Very good question. Very good. Other Any questions? other very good questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how's that? Yes. Mark, let me posit this hypothetical. A chief executive of a nation concludes, either based on intelligence or faulty intelligence, that a country in the subcontinent of Asia is developing nuclear weapons. He or she, this sovereign, initiates a preemptive strike at the nuclear site, unleashing a cloud of radiation equal to or greater than that of Chernobyl, killing tens of thousands of people and poisoning the environment. Yeah. It's subsequently determined that in fact this nuclear site was peaceful. What is the possibility in your mind, sir, that that sovereign would be tried as a international criminal? Well, we haven't got the, it depends on uh, the nation. Uh, it, it, you're going to see more uh, uh, CEOs of countries tried. Uh, we have Pinochet uh, in England. Uh, you, you had Saddam Hussein and other, other individuals. Uh, the, the question is of getting jurisdiction over the person. Uh, in other words, how do you get custody of the person? Uh, do you have to invade the country to do it? Uh, I, it's a very, uh, that's a, a, the international law is not adopted to nuclear uh, warfare as it should not, there's not been enough adjustment to it. Uh, and I hesitate to forecast what would happen. I, it might be a fresh case, but uh, are you talking about a developing country or are you talking about a developed country? I'm talking about a developed country. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the morality of one is one thing, it should be prosecuted. That's the morality of it. And the problem is uh, custody. How do you get jurisdiction and unanimity? unanimity in the uh, Security Council for prosecution. But that's one of the things that, uh, that's why the aggression thing is so important. That's why this negotiation that takes place before 2009 on aggression is so important. That'll probably reach some, some subjects like that. It's uncovered at the present time. Henry, do you care to comment on the use of the rule of law for changes in uh, governments? For example, what our good friend David Crane used in creating literally a change in the government in Liberia with Charles Taylor. Well, he did it with UN support. And when you do it with the United Nations support, and that's one of the implicit questions in yours, uh, then you have more credibility. Uh, the, uh, it's very hard to get the UN to operate because as we try to push these, uh, as good nations try to push these uh, principles through the Security Council, uh, they get vetoed by China and Russia. So. But uh, th your question is a, a very good one, and uh, 
It's the type of question that would be probably dealt with in the, uh, in the discussion of aggression. Other questions for, for mm -hmm. Mr. King? Yes. I, I'm not sure exactly what's your stand on um, how you would feel about the government or their own citizens are being um, badly mistreated by that government, severe um, human rights violations such as some of these countries in Africa you mentioned. What is the international community to do in those cases? Well, let's use, for example, like Darfur. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Therefore, we're, we're trying to mobilize uh, the, the world community, and here the United States is on the right side. But uh, China needs uh, Sudan's oil and is dragging its feet on that. Uh, you sh you, the, idea, the way you've got to do it is through the Security Council. That's their jurisdiction, and that's the way it should be done. But it's. They haven't had progress in that regard because of the opposition to countries. Uh, so the world needs a uh, the rule of law needs a needs a lot of expansion in this world today. What about intervention? Like, would the United Nations troops go in to rectify the situation? Well, they have got some uh, of uh, Af African peacekeepers in there now in in Darfur. But uh, what I want to do is see the leaders who are committing these crimes tried at the uh, Hague, that's the International Criminal Court, that's where they are. They had to get in there and try them, set an example for the world, that's what it's all about. And uh, in this case, even though the United States does not recognize the International Criminal Court, they did not object to uh, the turnover of people from Darfur to the criminal court for trial. The problem again is uh, uh, how you account physically accomplish it. Uh, do, do you think, Henry, that was sort of a, the first maybe breach in the uh, the the uh, representation that that we would not involve ourselves with the ICC that, in fact, we abstained, if you will, yeah. and permitted that to happen. Yeah. So that's a backhanded recognition of the International Criminal Court. But my point on the Criminal Court is that our soldiers would be protected if you enforce the rule of law all over the world. That uh, these principles are the Nuremberg principles. They're the same principles that Jackson enunciated at Nuremberg. And uh, they govern war crimes, they govern crimes against humanity, and uh, they could use, the criminal court could be used for our benefit to protect our school soldiers, uh, soldiers from uh, war crimes. So I, I don't see the reason for the recognition. And as I pointed out in the speech, if you try your own soldiers, the court has no jurisdiction. And that is, was inserted, I believe, and I was there, to try to get the United States to join the International Criminal Court. I think most of the, uh, many of the, the United States Senator for are joining the International Criminal Court. And uh, here, we started it all with Robert Jackson. He's the one who started all this. A rule of law in the world, not a rule of force. And now, new law is going to be made without U.S. participation. I think in our own self-interest, we ought to get with it. Because the United States should play a leading role in human rights in the world. A leading role in preventing aggression. A leading role in preventing crimes against humanity. We should be the moral leaders of the world. I think this is a wonderful country. I adore it. And I think that uh, we ought to continue Jackson's vision. After all, it's a vision that's eternal. This is the blueprint for a whole world we've never seen before. 
where people have a sense of security, where justice reigns, and where human have human rights across the board, uh, whether it's in the wilds of Africa or in the streets of New York or in Moscow or in Beijing. Uh, I think that we'd have a happier, a more secure world if we did something like this. I think the U.S. can got to get in there and lead the way again. And uh, I don't want to have us be the object of cynicism on the part of our former friends. After all, the greatest supporters of the International Criminal Court are the Germans. The greatest supporters of Nuremberg are the Germans, and they were the ones who had tried it. And there's a provision in the German Constitution against aggression. They can't commit aggression. That's all about progress. Europe has accepted Nuremberg, and the U.S. has turned it back on it. I want to have us recognize our own future and to think of future generations because the technology of destruction is so great that it's outrunning the ability to man's ability to live peacefully under rule of law. Technology of destruction places immense power in small uh, regimes. Somebody push a button and you have an atomic explosion. I say that we can't continue to let technological destruction outrun, outrun the extension of the rule of law. That's what it's all about. And uh, that's what Spear said in his closing statement, that he was concerned that some nations would be living peacefully, minding their own business, and then others would be uh, working on means of destroying humanity. Uh, I say that we have to reach out, whether it's North Korea, Iran, uh, try to work out some diplomatic solutions with them. The power that uh, technology plays, see, technology is amoral. It's not good or bad. And uh, I think that some technology is very destructive. And that's what I'm worried about. So I don't think uh, we should wait. I think we should take action as soon as possible. And I hope that the United States Senate, led by Chris Dodd, who's a former, uh, who was a son of my former colleague at Nuremberg, Tom Dodd, who was a very close friend of mine, uh, could be one that could introduce a resolution uh, asking that we join the International Criminal Court. And uh, I think it'd be supported by the, the Senate, but that's just my belief. So you got a choice. What kind of a world do you want to live in? You want to live in a world of insecurity where war is the order of the day? Or do you want to live in a world which is ruled by law and reason? It's really force versus reason. And man's distinguishing characteristics is his reason. That's what it's all about. As Jackson said, this trial is the most significant, one of the most significant tributes that power, meaning the rule of force, has paid to reason. And Jackson was the one who started it all. That's why we're here tonight. And he fought his way to get U.S. to accept the position that there should be a trial. And he turned it back, we turned our back on Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin and a number of our cabinet members. That was Jackson and Simpson, who were the fathers of Nuremberg, and the ones who created these new institutions like they're building. The International Criminal Court is, after all, institutionalizing Nuremberg. 
And I think where you have progress in the world, I think you have to institutionalize it. It can't die with a heartbeat. You got to have continuity. That's, that's what it's all about. And with the criminal court at the Hague, that'll be a thousand years. It'll be far more important than it is today. And uh, we'll be better for it. And uh, we'll be uh, putting into, we'll be implementing Jackson's great vision, for which he paid a heavy price. I mean, he took the slings and arrows of his countrymen. But he's much appreciated now. I think we in the United States need more, we need some heroes. It's nice to worship Washington and Lincoln and all that. But we might need some more uh, more recent heroes. People are really good people. And people who added to a better <coughs> world for everybody. Not just us, but everybody. And people who can afford to dream like Jackson. And, you know, some people say, well, Jackson was a dreamer. And, of course, you know that some dreams are, are uh, don't stand the light of day. Others become outdated. But then there are others which become part of our world the world in which we live, and the world of the future. We have to think of future generations. I say that the greatest danger is not to dream at all. I think the reason we had Nur at Nuremberg was because of Jackson's dream and his ability to look ahead and is concerned with future generations, not just the current generation. Well, maybe that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about it. I think you've just witnessed an individual who has carried the dream of Robert Jackson. And Henry King, you're, you're an incredible individual. We're blessed to have you here this evening. We're thanks to the Warren County Historical <coughs> Society, to Judge Morgan and providing this opportunity of, of, to have this event here, the Warren County Bar Association, and, and all everybody who made this all possible tonight to have Henry King in our midst. So, uh, we thank you. We thank you profusely to being our first lecturer here at the Jackson. I'm honored to be here, and I thank everybody for coming. Uh, I think this is an important subject. I, we need more forums like this, and I rely on you to create them. <laughs> <laughs> interested, his speech, a uh, copy of it will be going to the Warren County Historical Society, as well as I'll be up on our website, www.robertHJackson.org, so if you want to see it, see it and read it again, that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Sure. Thank you, Henry. Oh, good. Did that go all right? <laughs> Did you hear pin, when your pin drop? <laughs> oh, boy. These Boy Scouts are going to come uh, up here. These the Boy Scouts are going to come up here. Me on the book list, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. All right, sure. Great. Appreciate Henry, it. Henry, nice wonderful you. speech. Well, Good well, seeing well, you again. Well, thank Take you. care of yourself. And next time website. in Cleveland, I'll pop in. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Take, you. Care. Take care, guys. Pleasure. He's not going to sell it. He'll just make copies. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Excuse me?